Nebuchadnezzar, mad king, or someone we've actually just misunderstood. Hello, and welcome to the Invisible Body. This week we're checking out King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 of Daniel. Um, we're specifically looking at chapter 4 because he is suffering with mental illness at that chapter. Um, I thought, why not look at this? Because a lot of the articles I have read recently around this have been about how mental illness is used as a punishment or a test from God and we need to um, just turn back to Jesus and our mental illness will be healed. Now, I can't even tell you how mad some of these articles made me um, or how frustrated I was by the sermons that I read online um, because it minimizes mental health down to a test or um, something that uh, if we just need to um, look for forgiveness, it's a punishment. Um, and basically all I can say to that is crap. That's just crap. Um, that is not what mental illness boils down to. So I thought I would delve into this story a little bit um, and try and look at, okay, so is that what it's saying? Mental illness is a punishment from God or are we actually missing a bigger picture here? I mean, I think we are, but that's just my take on it. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar, what do we know about him? Um, he's a pretty big dude um, in terms of uh, history and things like that. So he was the king of Babylon. Um, he, he was uh, quite vicious and Daniel who's also now known as Belshazzar is only really looked after by the king because he can interpret his dreams um, because Nebuchadnezzar is a bit of a dreamer. Um, he has a lot of dreams that kind of upset him. He has a whole court of magicians and interpreters and things like that and um, yeah Daniel is uh, inspired by God and so is part of the whole, he's known as the chief of magicians in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, not a very nice guy. Um, we know historically that he was a bit inflated on his own ego. So there are whole towns and cities and buildings and things where every block is inscribed with Nebuchadnezzar's name, a kind of like a seal on it. Um, and this is because Nebuchadnezzar wanted everybody to know that he is the boss, he is the man. Look at what he has done, he is incredible. He is like, yeah, he wants everyone to know. So every single block is like, boom, hello, I am Nebuchadnezzar, I built this. Um, he has a vast empire, masses of wealth. Uh, basically ends up thinking he is as good as a god. Um, he is as powerful, he is as strong, he, I mean, who could bring him down? You know, he, he's a bit puffed up on himself, really. And so um, he has this dream where he dreams about this great tree that stretches to the sky um, that is cut down or ordered to be cut down by a messenger from heaven. Um, and when he has this dream, he's really disturbed by it. So he gets all his magicians in, including Daniel, and tells them the dream. And Daniel is really uh, quite nervous about telling the king had the interpretation um, because it's not good news. So he basically says, hey, old Nebby, um, this is a dream about you. You are the tree. Um, you know, you are going to be cut down by God for seven years. Um, you are going to be humiliated, basically. And after that, when you turn your eyes to God and you repent, you will be healed. You will be saved. Um, and then a year after that, Nebuchadnezzar is chilling out on his roof um, of his palace, looking at his amazing city, and is like, 
basically talking himself up and being like, I am the man, I am the boss, I am as good as God, pretty much. And in that moment, he is struck down with a thing called, um, which is now known as boanthropy, or also could possibly be lycrothropy, um, which is a mental illness where you believe you are an animal. Um, in boanthropy, it is specifically a you believe you are um, bovine. Um, you eat grass and you uh, believe you're an animal. And this kind of coincides with the description of what Nebuchadnezzar goes through for the next seven years where he is isolated from human contact, he goes out into the field, it says the dew wets his back, he grows hair like feathers and fingernails like claws and eats grass like the animals. Um, and at the end of that he turns his eyes up to heaven and acknowledges God as the most high God and uh, his illness is taken away and he goes back to being a king, albeit a very humble king this time. Now there are a few kind of contextual things that I want to pick up on. First of all, there are inscriptions historically outside of the Bible that do talk about King Nebuchadnezzar having a severe illness. Um, it doesn't really go into it because we don't have a lot of inscriptions and things that have survived that long, um, but there is some indication that this actually did happen. Um, there is also another uh, King of Babylon that occurs after Nebuchadnezzar who also went through seven years of illness. Um, I think it's called inflammation of his brain or something like that. So there is some argument that uh, the two stories have been intertwined. Either way, it's kind of irrelevant um, in terms of whether which king it was um, because the story is, the meta-narrative of it is about um, the, this king who is uh, very strong and capable and has a lot of stuff and is um, very powerful. It is about his um, humbling before God. So whether or not it was actually Nebuchadnezzar or another king has been um, placed over top of this story and the two have been kind of put together, um, the, the message is still the same. It doesn't matter which one. Um, a couple of other things. The language in Hebrew about the tree that reaches to heaven is the same language that is used around the Tower of, the Tower of Babel reaching to heaven. So it's this idea of men um, going above their station, men trying to be like God, men trying to reach the heavens and, um, and, and be God. Um, and that uh, would have probably been very apparent to the readers of the day in the original Hebrew that these two, this, these two stories of Babel and Babylon um, are, are meant to be linked in their language. Um, so we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about it. Um, that this tree is not just a tree, it is a tree or Nebuchadnezzar is trying to be God. Um, and just as the Tower of Babel was was shut down in, in quite dramatic ways, so is Nebuchadnezzar. Now the mental illness of Nebuchadnezzar is um, the way that it's laid out is quite frustrating for those of us who have struggled with mental illness. Um, I myself have PTSD and am on medication for it. Um, if I don't take my medication, my entire world falls apart. Um, so mental illness is something I have lived with. I uh, had um, very bad psychosis when I was younger, um, in my early 20s, um, and was in psych wards and things for that. Um, so I understand uh, Nebuchadnezzar's whole not being part of society because of mental health problems. And my husband struggles with uh, suicidal depression, so the idea of mental health being a punishment uh, is something I find really difficult to wrestle with because uh, everything in me screams at that and, and goes, no, mental health, uh, mental illness is not a punishment. God is with us in our mental illness. However, this story we need to remember is linked to the story of Babel. And so the idea of Nebuchadnezzar going above his station 
is uh, and trying to be like God is really important to understand because this isn't a story of uh, mental illness in general. This is a story of mental illness, um, or a, a not even mental illness, a punishment. This is a story of punishment for becoming like, trying to become like God. That God um, humbles Nebuchadnezzar and says, no, you are actually uh, not God, you are a creation. There are some really interesting things I would like to pull out of the story um, of his mental illness. First of all, you're king of a huge empire, right? If you go AWOL for seven years, it is incredible that his position as, as king or emperor or whatever the heck his position was, was kept open for him, that he was so respected or feared that uh, the other members of the court didn't rise up and try and kill him, try and take over his throne. Um, you know, if there wasn't huge infighting or anything like that that we know of. It appears that he disappeared for seven years and they basically kept it all running for him. Um, there is some evidence to say that his son was his regent during that time. And then he just waltzes back on in, in his former position. Now I really like this because for me it says that his mental illness did not actually detract from him as a person. Now I, I think of, you know, if one of our uh, leaders of our countries suddenly developed a very severe mental illness and uh, believed that they were uh, bovine um, and was eating grass out in fields and things, there is no way in heck that our society would be understanding enough to allow them back into a position of power once they came back to themselves, once that illness was under control. We would not allow that. Um, and I find that quite surprising when I read this story, that in this time that we consider ancient and... Um, Perhaps with a little bit of pride and arrogance, we believe that these people, because they lived so long ago, are a little bit behind our society um, in terms of, you know, justice and all that kind of thing. Um, but here is a society that was quite open and accepting of their leader having an illness and then it being gone, that he went mad and then he was okay and so that was okay he was back doing what he always did and I think this is a really um, interesting thing that the church could really pick up on and the fact that we as a society tend to um, walk on eggshells around people who have mental illness or who have had mental illness we tend to um, ignore it or we tend to uh, pretend it didn't happen, um, or we um, kind of wait for them to have another breakdown. Um, there's a whole lot of ways that we uh, kind of avoid the issue instead of actually allowing that person to be a person and their mental illness to be an illness, rather than the mental illness being the person. Um, and so I, I really like this, this story of, of Nebuchadnezzar, where he does have this quite severe illness, where he is isolated from his people and his court and his job and everything, and yet at the end of it, he comes back and everybody accepts him. They, they just go, okay, he's back, sweet, his illness is over. Um, and I think that's a reading of this story that we have really missed that there is an acceptance and a love and a, um, a way of being with people who have mental illness or, or who have had mental illness um, that is far more advanced than what our society um, currently practices. Um, so I, I think that actually the, the point of the story, though it is about punishment and it is about the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar. I think there are a lot more 
stories uh, and and meanings that can be taken out of this that we have ignored because we have gone, oh, well, it's punishment, obviously, he went mad, so he's obviously a bad king, rather than going, okay, yes, he had this mental illness, and yes, it does appear to be tied with, in this particular situation, for this particular person, it is tied with um, punishment and uh, humbling and all that kind of thing um, but there are also some other stories to be taken out of this mainly one of acceptance of of his illness one of allowing him back into society in the position and the fullness of the human he was before his illness um, things that we uh, are missing in our sermons um, the number of sermons I have read that have taken this individual instance of mental illness as a punishment and applied it to everybody with mental illness, which is so damaging. It is incredibly damaging to say that because people with mental illness are often uh, feel like they have been abandoned by God, feel like they have been abandoned by people around them, um, feel like they... Um, their prayers are not being answered, they are confused, they don't understand why God isn't listening to them. And so when we turn that around and say, well, it's because you're being punished, is that going to help them or is that going to drive them closer to despair? Is that going to make them feel loved and accepted by Jesus or is that going to make them feel even more misunderstood and outcast? Instead, we could use this story to show an acceptance and grace and love of the community around Nebuchadnezzar even while he was in his illness um, that yes God uses some very strange ways of punishing and humbling people particularly in the Old Testament that we don't really understand but it is the um, reaction of those around Nebuchadnezzar that we could really draw from Another thing I would like to point out is that um, God very clearly warns Nebuchadnezzar that if he does not change his ways, a punishment is coming. Now this is very different from mental illness that most people experience. There is no warning. There is no um, reason for mental illness. Um, and I think when we go oh look, this one story of punishment can be applied to everybody with mental illness. We are actually undermining what God is trying to do with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, that God in his grace and in his love and in his wisdom gives Nebuchadnezzar a warning and Nebuchadnezzar ignores it. Now, God isn't doing that with other mental illness. God isn't, isn't standing up with everybody who suffers from depression or schizophrenia or whatever, boanthropy, um, and saying, if you don't change your ways, this is going to happen. Now, this may still happen in individual cases, but it isn't happening across the board. And so we cannot take this one story and apply it to everybody because the circumstances are very different. And I think God himself would be horrified um, in hearing some of the sermons we have created out of this one story instead of going, look, God in his grace and mercy warned this Nebuchadnezzar that a punishment was coming and then in his grace and his mercy allowed forgiveness and, and restoration in Nebuchadnezzar. I think those are the big elements of the story. The punishment in the middle could have been anything, but it happened to be a mental illness. And so we have taken that and gone, well, that explains every mental illness, particularly because mental illness is an illness that is so hard to understand, it is easy to simplify it rather than delving into it further and going, how do I, as, as somebody who knows someone with mental illness, how do I love this person as a person with the mental illness there, also on the other side of mental illness? How do I love them and support them in the way that they need, rather than trying to oversimplify 
the reason that they have this illness and actually causing more damage and more harm, particularly spiritually for that person. So in summary, King Nebuchadnezzar did experience mental illness as a punishment from God. But this is an isolated incident. Just as God uses in the Old Testament punishment um, with other types of illnesses, in this particular one, mental illness was used to humble King Nebuchadnezzar. However, the story is about God's grace and love and mercy in warning Nebuchadnezzar and in restoring Nebuchadnezzar. It is not about the punishment bit in the middle. In fact, there is very little um, actually talked about in terms of the illness itself. I think there's one or two verses in the middle saying basically he was ill and that was it. Secondly, we cannot take this one story of mental illness as a punishment and apply it to every mental illness and every person we know who struggles with mental illness ever. To do so is to isolate people from community and to isolate them from God and to create confusion and pain in people who are already suffering from confusion and pain. It is um, a misreading of the text, it is um, damaging to the person and I think it is extremely unchristlike to do so. Thirdly, the way that Nebuchadnezzar's community responds to him is something that we should speak more about. That that is where our sermons should be placed and where we should be reading um, into that story this idea that Nebuchadnezzar was king before he got ill and king afterwards and nobody actually said, hey, you shouldn't be king at any point during that. Um, I think there is a real story of grace and of um, acceptance that our society and our churches are not good at at the moment with mental illness. That we are um, very judgmental and uh, very, um, and we push people out of community when they are ill. And then once they are well again, if they get well again, we are cautious about inviting them back in. Um, and this story of Nebuchadnezzar, that doesn't occur. His community accepts that their king is unwell, but he is still their king. And once he is well again, they celebrate that he is back. Um, that is how we should be responding to people with mental illness. So I think a rereading of this story as one of grace, of love, of mercy, of community is much more helpful to us than one of punishment, of judgment and of uh, blanket misunderstanding of mental illness and its causes. I hope you find this really helpful. Um, I'm going to say a quick prayer and uh, then I'll wrap this up. Father, thank you for your wisdom, your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the story of Nebuchadnezzar um, and the things that we can learn from that in terms of mental illness and how to treat those around us um, who have mental illness. And Jesus, I ask for your grace and your love to be paramount in our lives as we uh, walk with those who are unwell, that we will accept them as a person rather than an illness, and that we will embrace them in our communities. Spirit, change our hearts, change our minds, so that we are oriented towards loving those who need love the most, rather than telling them that they are being punished by you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. We'll see you next time. <laughs>